Hey everybody, thanks for hanging in. I, I appreciate you staying to the very last. It's been a long day, but it's been really interesting and cool to see the intensity uh, of presentations of people at this intersection of social science and environmental health. Usually you go to a meeting and there's either zero or one. So to have a full day uh, with this intensity is really great. Um, our last panel is about biomonitoring, the measurement of uh, chemicals in, in blood, urine, breast milk, or other kinds of tissues, or in personal spaces like your home, someplace where the, uh, the person and the results are very much connected. And, um, Increasingly, studies are using personal biomonitoring to make the connection to health. You heard about that in the PROTECT session just now, um, but also as a strategy for population health tracking um, in the U.S. and Europe and worldwide. So, and uh, we'll come back to some of those questions that came up in the PROTECT session about um, reporting to people on their own exposures. So um, in keeping with Phil's request that the introductions be minimal, uh, Ruth Ann Rudell, who's listed as the moderator, is, is here and she'll be around for the question section, but I'm just going to quickly uh, turn it over to our speakers. First, uh, Cheryl Patton from the Commonwealth Biomonitoring Resource Center. So I work at a place called Commonwealth. Um, Bucolic setting in Costa California, works in three core areas, health and healing, art, education, environment and justice. And we say basically our overriding umbrella set of words as we work on personal and planetary healing. Uh, this sounds a little bit California, doesn't it? But <laughs> I want you to notice that we did not put in the term intergalactic healing. We thought we should draw the line somewhere, so we did. And... Um, um, that the main program of Commonweal is our Commonweal Cancer Help Program. And we do week-long retreats for people with cancer, helping them learn how to become healthy cancer patients as much as possible, deepening their experience of healing rather than curing. Uh, who comes to that uh, retreat differs decade to decade, five-year increments, whatever. But the people coming in now tend to be young women with me, uh, metastasized breast cancer. And they're coming now mainly because they want to learn how to say goodbye to their children. So the, that kind of work underlies almost all the programs of Commonwealth. It's the basis for all our work, and it certainly is the basis of my work in biomonitoring. So I want to get right to it. Um, uh, when we found out the CDC was going to release a report about 16 chemicals and uh, population in the United States, we thought, uh, working with Environmental Working Group and Mount Sinai School of Medicine, that we could do that a little bit better. We could test ourselves for 210 chemicals, and we could report back to everybody in the study what the results were and just see what it felt like. So we spent a lot of time with this small cohort here um, talking about what we thought we would feel and what we would think about and what kind of information we wanted and how did we want to get it. And um, it turns out that Bill Moyers was one of that people in the cohort and he'd, he uh, documented his blood draw and getting his results on a documentary he was doing called Trade Secrets, which had to do with a company that knew very well it was exposing its workers to a chemical that was related to brain cancer. So we, with a bunch of other NGOs across the country, arranged viewings for this documentary when it came out on PBS. And sure enough, at the day after the, this showing, hundreds of people were calling all of us that were organizing this, saying, where can we get biomonitored? We want to know our results right away. So we thought, well, this is really interesting. And then also at the time, one of my jobs is work on the, the Stockholm Convention that was regulating POPs chemicals. And my job was to bring to these conferences scientists that could talk to the delegates about POPs chemicals. Uh, because most of the delegates were working for the Ministry of Trade, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, whatever. They knew nothing about toxic chemicals. So we would bring in panels of scientists from uh, scientists around the world who would talk about POPs chemicals, exposure pathways, health outcomes, and so on. And at one of these chemical uh, uh, panels, Sandra Steigraber came, and she was going to be the last person speaking. And she said, what should I talk about? 
and everybody will have said everything behind by the time they get to me. And I said, why don't you talk about breast milk? Because at the time she was breastfeeding her baby girl, Faith, at that point was about six months old. And she said, okay, I'll do that. So the panel went on, and she had expressed some breast milk to feed her baby girl uh, while uh, Sandra was speaking, and she kept a little vial. So at the end of the, the panel, she was giving her talk, she passed the round of vial of her breast milk, she was saying, this is one of the most contaminated substances on the food chain. This would be illegal to be sold in, story, in stores. It's the best, best food for babies, but unless we do work now on Pops Chemicals, we will be compromising the integrity of breast milk. And as she was saying that, the, her friend who was taking care of Faith walks down the corridor, and Faith hears her mother's voice. So the baby starts to cry, just then. And it changed the whole tenor of the conversation, because it was like the future generations crying. It was just quite amazing. You could just feel the palpable change in the room. And, uh, uh, the delegates left, the guy from Kenya, the head of delegation, he was very pro-DDT when he walked in, walking out. He says, DDT is going to become illegal in Kenya. And it, it did, and it still is. It's probably used illegally, but it's illegal. And the guy from France, head of delegation, says, I'm going to change the way France's pesticides policies work from now on. So the power of this story is really clearly there. So we thought the data is important, but we need to find a way to help people get the story out. So we started experimenting a little bit. Um, we decided to set up a biomonitoring resource center to help communities design and implement biomonitoring projects that would tell stories of personal and community pollution. We wanted to do this to create greater understanding of environmental health issues, dissolve the borders between academic researchers and community members, and help communities own and use the data and the stories of those biomonitored to support campaigns and validate the concerns and so on. So we set up a series of uh, biomonitoring studies. Uh, the first one was luminary. Uh, we, we selected some luminaries in California, uh, academicians, environmental justice leaders, movie stars, uh, and some mothers, people uh, advocating for around particular health issues and talk to them about whether they'd like to be biomonitored and whether if they were biomonitored and got their results and got some counseling, would they be willing to speak publicly? Um, and they didn't need to make that decision now, but that would be the intent of the study for them to learn about the chemicals in their bodies and speak about it. And we wanted to do this first report in support of legislation in California that would establish a California biomonitoring program that would biomonitor Californians and also would report back to Californians what their results were should they so request it. So this person is uh, Peter Coyote, who's a movie star and friend of Commonwealth and friend of many people. Uh, we spent a time with him for him to talk, describe to us how he would like to describe who he was and then again how what he would like to talk about in terms of what his results were. And so he came up with his own messages, of course. Uh, we published this booklet called Taking It All In. My alternative title was going to be, you're so full of it. <laughs> but I realized that was not going to work. <laughs> Taking it all in, and so he could give that to state legislators, and indeed we do now have the California Biomonitoring Program. I'm going to go through these a little quickly. And then we wanted to do a neighborhood study, uh, testing people that look like the people next door. Uh, so we tested seven individuals in each of five states. Uh, these were recruited by state-based NGOs. Uh, and again, we asked people to be willing to talk publicly about their results, however they wanted to do it, but they didn't have to decide until they got their results, until they got information about the chemicals they were exposed to, and until they were counseled by our physician of record, who spent a lot of time with them talking about the significance of their data. And uh, this is called Is It In Us, which is kind of closure, so full of it and so are we, but it's a little <laughs> bit reserved for that. Is It In Us, and uh, tested for, uh, I don't know, not just bisphenol A, but about 12 different chemicals, because the point was that we never want to test for one, one chemical, we want to test for a range of chemicals. This point is really, we're not just one chemical dealing with, we're talking about the kind of mixtures of chemicals. And they came up with, uh, this, is the, this little booklet here is their public report out, uh, and they decided what kind of information they wanted to be in it. They wanted a bar chart showing their levels. 
I thought when they said bar chart, we would have names of different bars and grills on the city, you know, the city street, and we could make little funny jokes about it. But they did not want to be funny. They wanted to be straight ahead. And so this is what we have. This is our bar chart, and that's what they wanted to share with people. And this particular pamphlet was then taken to state legislators and was responsible for passing laws in different states about chemical policy. Now each of these individuals chosen were actually nested in with the advocacy community somehow. They weren't walking in not knowing anything about toxic chemicals. They weren't recruited off the street because we wanted data from them. We were to take it from them and try to persuade them that was interesting data. These people were already well motivated to participate and excited about doing so. So as you can see it's a diverse uh, group of people. And then the last thing we wanted to do in this particular series was to biomonitor people that were dealing with a particular health effect, which had to do with learning and developmental disabilities. So we monitored leaders in national disability, learning and developmental disability organizations, and uh, each of them spoke about the, who they were and what their responses were to the data they received. Uh, and this particular uh, report out called Mind Disruptor was then used at a congressional hearing and was uh, given to legislators uh, at the federal level about the, the dangers of what we're doing to our children's brains with uh, exposures to neurotoxicants in utero. Uh, and they particularly wanted to talk about perchlorate, and of course we use this particular slide. Uh, to, we had a, uh, an opportunity then we set to talk about how the CDC average to compare that is informative information, but to point out the CDC average is not normal. It's not a safety standard, um, and that uh, the safety standard that was in fact set for perchlorate exposure is a little bit bogus if you go into the history of that. So we could talk to them, we could use the information that we were giving them and their questions to talk more about each chemical, what the standards were, what the laws were, and give them a fuller range of information about what, what we thought was be important about it and understand what they wanted back from it, including all the other chemicals that could relate to, by different mechanisms, to ne neurological aberrations. Uh, so what's the process here? First of all, we always made clear to participants that, that we would find chemicals of concern in their body. There was just no doubt about it. And that everybody in the United States and probably around the world would have chemicals in their body as well. And we would not be able to connect individual chemical body burden to individual health outcomes. Uh, that was just not going to be possible. But that knowing one's body burden can itself be a burden. Once you know what's in your body at that particular moment, you don't forget it. You don't forget it. and. Um, you uh, may experience health problems later on in life and you will wonder whether you're having those health problems because of the chemicals in your body at that time a few years before. Some of them are going to be there still, some will have passed through. And you'll wonder about that and you'll not have an answer to that. So how do you live with that kind of uncertainty? So we talk also about if you decide to go public about your results, you may be targeted by reporters, by your community, for people who support that particular industry that's producing the chemical uh, you are concerned about. How are you going to deal with this kind of attention that maybe you hadn't planned on? And you're going to be asked uncomfortable questions or questions you won't know the answers to. And how can we help you learn how to deflect questions to uh, a scientist, a toxicologist, an epidemiologist, so the focus always is on you, your experience, and your story. And we talk to also about what happens when you get your results. But how are you really going to feel? And we would talk sometimes on a phone call, a conference call, people would join not by giving their name or fake name, not identify themselves and talk about once they got the results, what their reactions were. And I would often open up that kind of conversation uh, to create a space where we could talk about fear, we could talk about despair, we could talk about helplessness and uh, I move forward and, and I would talk about how the, f the fact that my husband and I were both biomonitored for chemicals. We've never been able to have children and both of us had a lot, about 60 chemicals in our bodies at that time related to reproductive problems. So did that relate to our infertility? We have no idea. And I have yet to say that to a community of people interested in being biomonitored and not have it greeted with some kind of silence as people reflect and, and, and sometimes people speak forward and say yes. We've never been have, ever able to have a child, or we had a preterm child, or we had a spontaneous abortion, so on. Just getting a sense of what a community of people share that are concerned about toxic chemicals and health outcomes. And that's a sense of grief there and unhappiness. And moving through that and expressing it somehow releases us all to move forward to the next step and take action. 
So that's something I always, I always want to talk about with people, depending on the community, depending on how open they are to it. Uh, and then we all make the point that personal body burden levels can provide information that can make guide personal choices. That's necessary, but it's not sufficient. You're not going to shop your way out of that. You don't have that much control. So we want to introduce the idea of speaking publicly to influence policy early on, encourage people that we will support to do that. And the last thing we always do is, I think is most important, we honor the participants who choose to participate. We congratulate them for doing it. They are pioneers. They're taking a brave step forward. They're going to be stepping into uncertainty. They're going to be targeted. They're going to be carrying a lot of information. It's very important. And we ask them, look, when you sit down with your phlebotomist, before the blood is drawn, ask for a moment of silence. Take a deep breath. Close your eyes. And thank yourself. Thank yourself for future, inter for future generations. It's a moment of solemnity. Let's honor ourselves. Let's honor the process. Let's honor the project. Let's honor what we can do with this information. So that's probably different from what epidemiologists do, I think. Yeah, probably. Mm -hmm. But it's very powerful, and it's very real. And I think it's very necessary to acknowledge what this is truly about. So we give them, uh, we mail them individual results, an aggregated results, information packet about all the chemicals. Uh, possibly current policy stuff. They're canceled, uh, counseled by a phone conversation by a physician of record immediately after receiving results. We don't really give them much of a choice. We just say, okay, your packet's going to be here on Monday. Your conversation with uh, Ted Shetler is Tuesday. Uh, can you make that or should we schedule something else? It's just straight ahead. Part of hand holding them, and by that point, they're more or less used to that. Then we often arrange a phone call with him with a leading researcher of a particular chemical of concern. The researcher gives a presentation about what their current uh, study is about, and then we encourage questions because the people in that community now realize they are experts too, and they can talk to a scientist, and they can ask questions, and they can be taken seriously, and they can have a relationship with that scientist and talk to that scientist or their staff six months from now. So it's a matter of empowerment as well as uh, education. Um, of course, we collaborate, them, collaborate with them on the report out materials. We may do media training, and then if they're up for it, we work with media consultants to get their stories on TV. We've been pretty successful with that. Print, radio, media, and so on, congressional briefly, state legislators, community organizations, and sometimes in market campaign work as well. So it kind of snowballs. We tend to work with small groups of people. It's just cheaper for one. And we also find that working with small groups of people, the level of connection and conversation is deeper. It's easier to have rather than dealing with 40 or 80 people. Are we accomplishing what we think we are? Well, we joined with Silent Spring, who uh, gracefully and, 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 and uh, quite nicely agreed to interview many of the people that we interviewed to see, were we doing, were we accomplishing what we thought we were accomplishing? Do we really have a sense of that? What was the evaluation? And so uh, Silent Spring did some interviews and, and came up with the conclusions that yes, in the report back process, we were increasing uh, trust in science in the committee and the individuals. We were increasing environmental health literacy, uh, adding to individual and community empowerment, uh, strong motivation to reduce exposures. The researchers as well as participants gained unexpected insights into characteristics and sources of environmental contamination. And participants are almost universally eager to receive the results and do not regret them. And indeed, uh, perhaps because we have motivated people we talk to, we've never had anybody uh, curl up and run screaming into the corner and, and assuming a fetal position in fear of getting the results. It just doesn't happen. But the more information we give people, the more interested they are. They have reasonable concern, but the more motivated they are to take action, personal and political. So that's really good. Uh, next steps, uh, we're starting to do biomonitoring studies that combine scientific research with community engagement processes. We're working with uh, Rachel Morella Frosch and Ruth Andrew Dell, Breast Cancer Fund, and two firefighter uh, organizations in San Francisco to biomonitor uh, uh, women firefighters, 80 women firefighters and 80 women office employees for targeted and untargeted chemicals, early health outcomes, monitoring uh, stress levels, uh, uh, looking at markers for shift work, uh, telomere length, uh, thyroid functioning, uh, and written into our grant proposal was also the idea that this data is to be used 
for policy change. It's news you can use. It's not going to go on a shelf. And we're working closely with the firefighters, including the International Association of Firefighters, about how this data might be most effectively used. Also be used to maybe improve firefighter protocols in terms of washing gear, getting truly protective gear, and so on. A lot of things can be done in a fire station, but there's a lot of things to be done with the flame retardants as well. So why change? Why are we going to do that? Well, after we did a series of biomonitoring studies, we had a sense that perhaps at that point in time, there's a, a loss of surprise for many communities to suddenly find that, yes, we knew we had so many chemicals in our body, but we would know I had no idea we had 80, 90, 100. So, uh, and maybe the press was a little tired of that. Maybe the general public was a little tired of that. So how do we reframe the message a little bit to keep an interest going? and a concern going, so we thought we needed to expand a little bit. Uh, Biomonitoring is expensive, uh, diminishing resources for everybody doing research. That certainly plays into this. Uh, is there something else that could be tested that might be more effective in getting a policy and personal changes across? Uh, Biomonitoring is focused on chemicals we know a bit about. There are assays developed that can actually identify these chemicals. So there's endless studies now on polybromine and diphenyl ethers. Do we need any more? Maybe not. Maybe we know enough, we think. Uh, but let's start looking at untargeted chemicals as well. Uh, and let's start looking at issues of mixtures of chemicals and how uh, other factors can moderate the toxicity of chemicals. Isn't that as important? Can we start thinking about maybe the broader picture and getting that about? Because we all know it's not the chemical. It's the system. It's not the chemical. It's the system. It's not the county. It's the state. It's not the state. It's the country. It's not the country. It's the globe. So. We have to keep expanding where you can really work to make the real deep changes. Um, so, uh, but given all that, the human story will always be important, and suffering of communities and individuals considers it continues. It uh, it does not stop. So we want to find ways to ratchet up the work in close conversation and collaboration with community members. It's really important. How do people learn? What do they want to learn? Communities come to us; they're wounded. They're looking for the arrow to fit the wound, all right? And, and it may be toxic chemical policy work. It may not be. Or toxic chemical policy work may be the wedge that helps address other issues. So long conversations need to happen about what is going to be most effective in terms of toxic chemical exposure assessment and how we can use that to make the systemic changes that need to happen. So that's what I think is really important. And the human stories of people is important. And just to say that all of these studies, all the outcomes may have been different in terms of what the policy asks were or what the personal changes were, but the basic message of the three studies and a couple of others that we've done has been there are toxic chemicals in my body. They have no business being there. Let's get them out. We don't have to prove health outcomes. We don't have to prove harm. We don't have to take 10 years to look at everybody's data to see what's going on. Not that that isn't important. That gives good information. But here and now, let's stop this suffering. If there's an untested chemical or chemical in my body that's toxic, let's get it out. Let's stop exposures. Let's find safer alternatives. And every community came up with that message. And so I share that here with you. Okay, thanks. So we're really privileged today to have Birgit uh, Dumez come, and she's been involved in the EU pilot program to do biomonitoring in 17 countries, uh, mother and children cohorts, uh, uh, amazing amount of work doing uh, report backs with the communities mm -hmm. and the, the countries, and she's going to tell us all about it and, and possible next steps. And I don't know how to find your PowerPoint in here, <laughs> but you don't. Yes, you do. See, she's so smart. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to thank the uh, organizer for inviting me. It's a real pleasure. Well, actually, I'm uh, replacing my colleague Ludwin Castellan, who unfortunately oh, okay. would love, would have loved to be here, but she couldn't. She couldn't be. How unfortunate. So, um, what I want to do is. Um, tell you about the biomonitoring, human biomonitoring process, um, projects that are currently ongoing and done and lessons are learned 
and uh, focus on some of the major difficulties that we experience in Europe. We have a legal framework since human biomonitoring requires and involves very sensitive ethical things. And we, the question we ask ourselves, is this legal framework protecting what it's supposed to be protecting for the participants throughout Europe? Uh, we have serious questions about uh, informed consent, and I will tell you how difficult it is to translate human biomonitoring results into uh, policy. And then uh, we have some conclusions and recommendations. But uh, our um, experience, where did we get it? Well, in 2003, there was a first communication out of the um, European Commission of interest in environmental and health. So in 2004, there started uh, a six-year project, uh, the um, um, Environment and Health Action Plan. It went to 2010. And a lot of projects were started at, at that moment. Human biomonitoring was just one team of it. And first of all, there, was, uh, there were two research projects, New Generis and ECNIS, that we were very closely involved. Uh, it's about newborns and genotoxic exposure in uh, women and child cohorts. It was also throughout Europe. And the ECNIS is about environmental cancer risk, nutrition, individual susceptibility, also a network of excellence within Europe. And we were, as with a scientific background, uh, really uh, deeply involved in, the pro in both uh, research projects. And it was actually the first time that there was a, pack a work package on communication, on ethics, on data protection. And year after year, we kept on telling these researchers that it existed and that they had to be trained in it. And all these um, uh, experiences and lessons learned, we took them with us to the COFES and the demo COFES uh, project, which um, Cheryl uh, already introduced. And this is really uh, the, the result of this uh, environmental health strategy in Europe. It took a long, long, long discussions between all the member states to arrive at uh, implementing a project. The COFES project first is a consortium, European consortium, to perform human biomonitoring on a European scale. And this is really important because in Europe, as ECNIS and New Generis, they are finished, everything falls back to its own. There is, everything is fragmented, Every, there is, uh, even in legislation, it's very difficult. And we need uh, European health reference values, and it's not available. And so uh, a year after COFES, which provided the framework um, for, to do such a study and such a survey, uh, DEMOCOF is started and it's a demonstration of a study to coordinate and perform human biomonitoring on a European scale. And this DEMOCOF is involved uh, 17 European countries and they investigated uh, mercury in hair, um, cadmium, cotinin, some phthalates and, uh, in urine. And um, yeah, they um, they did this in mother-child cohorts. It was uh, 120 pairs per country. They took uh, 60 rural and 60 urban uh, types. And even that was very difficult because in Europe, what is urban and what is rural? It differs in every country. Um, and um, well, these, uh, the results of that are being uh, are still impressed, but I'll tell you something about it uh, during this presentation and afterwards in the discussion. So uh, about this framework, we have a legal framework and we have a data protection. And this is a European directive and this is implemented in every country. But every country implements this in a different way. So in, uh, in a way, it, uh, it poses, imposes the practice of informed consent, including the right to know. And uh, you have to, you're obliged to notify to an, uh, the national data protection. And on the ethics, on the ethics side, uh, it's all also regulated on a national level, and this is based on the Oviedo Convention. That was uh, uh, it's a convention from the Council of Europe, and uh, it's additional protocol on biomedical research, and this uh, imposes the necessity of informed consent also and uh, the uh, approval from an ethics committee. So in theory, the rights of the, t of the study participants, they are well, um, they are legally base based and they are okay. 
but in the practice, I will not go too much into it here uh, due to time history. In, in practice, this doesn't happen. As Cheryl also said, uh, while they have a legally embedded right to know, individual results, they were not often communicated. It's like that in the practice. We were between those researchers and they didn't, they didn't know, they didn't even know that it was possible. Why? Because of a lack of time, because of there's no relevance at individual level, it's, too, um, it's the fear of causing unnecessary alarm, there's scientific uncertainty, there is no remedi remediation. Um, so these are all reasons why this does not happen in the practice. We told you about uh, the, a good example here is the, the, the survey in breast milk also. Everyone knows it's the best way to, to feed your baby, but on the other hand, there was very, very much alarm. Also, um, for, for example, in the, the Demococcus coffees, uh, it was very clear that women in, uh, in Spain and in Portugal, they had to six times higher level of mercury than the other women because they eat a lot of fish in down there. And then it's how, how, how do you balance this to say um, it, it's okay because uh, you, you cannot contradict with uh, the message from, from public health that it's good to eat fish for you. So uh, with a click on the mouse, we have a lot of data available from uh, healthy volunteers, but um, is this seen by researchers as an obstacle, an obstacle for research? But it has a positive side that uh, data protection laws, they facilitate our flow of information, which leads to, uh, creates also credible, incredible opportunities, and it helps raise trust, protect the accuracy. But on the researcher side, this is very much seen as unduly restricting it. Uh, think about secondary use of examples, of samples and, 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 and data. It's very, very, very difficult. And also, we see here that um, the decisional autonomy is too much emphasized. The collective aspect also in this uh, legislation should be more and more valued. So in our project in Europe, we try to, in human biomonitoring, introduce uh, uh, a new set of values beside the well-known Georgetown paradigm in bioethics. And it is democratic participation, solidarity, and social justice. We try to give it all to them in a kind of um, as a philosophical background, something they need that that it breaks breaks open the context and the legal context into to know what they are doing about. So in Europe, we are very much in a labyrinth of uh, rules and guidelines, inconsistencies. Some researchers really don't know where to start. They are of goodwill and they want to do it but they see this as a bureaucratic burden and they don't want to do this. Uh, for example, um, if you take samples in Poland and they are analyzed in the UK or in Sweden, uh, do I need a permit for Sweden or for the UK in Poland? It's, it's very difficult. And um, it's also, it can, it, can, it can be different also. Uh, and this might also lead to uh, a shopping phenomenon. Oh, it's much easier to collect uh, samples in that country and then we move it to that country. So all these things uh, happen, happen a lot. So there is a very big need for consistency uh, on data in Europe. And on one side, we need a more harmonized approach in Europe, but uh, we have to take a country's reality into, into value that uh, we all have different cultures, different economics, different uh, policies, etc. And also here, one of the key challenges of the COFES and the demo COFES project was to find the right balance between uh, a rigid structure, a not too rigid structure, and uh, room and to uh, let all the member states interpret uh, the documents that were standardized. So we had for everything, uh, there was a, a common protocol, which a consensus protocol, uh, which included um, all the selection criteria, um, uh, inf uh, all communication, leaflets, uh, data, protection, ethics, everything was standardized and they, had, they could adapt it to their country's uh, possibilities and reality. Then what we also, a lot of saw is, uh, we questioned very much the authenticity of informed consent and we saw how difficult and how, how important it is also to uh, raise participation rates in COFIS 
the participation rate was about 17 percent. It's not too high to know. So uh, indeed, there are a lot of pitfalls here. The authority of the status of the, uh, the person providing the information, the limited accuracy of information, correct understanding, the ability to decide, decisional autonomy versus constraints, uh, cultural differences are not also very important in genomics. Uh, uh, it's very interesting to have a uh, different lifestyle, different exposure, but the concept of autonomy is not the same for, for, for people, uh, ethnic minorities, instead of uh, other Western people. So what is an authentic consent? You should fe feel free in the decision to participate, equal relationship. I know you all uh, know that, so it's, it's, very, it's a very complex process in between two people. But it's different with everyone. And uh, I told the, um, the ethics committee in one of the countries in, um, in DEMOC office, they said you need more information, more information. But on the other, on the other hand, uh, people were sometimes they felt that they didn't know anymore because it was too much information. Sometimes they need less. One person needs more and the other person needs less. So it's, it's, it's very difficult. Now, within the scientific community, we made a, a film about informed consent. It was, uh, we had the help of a psychologist and it was played by actors. It was very funny because these people, they, they just played who they are and, and you saw really that it's a difference of what happens in a unique uh, conversation between two people. So it's very difficult. So, but here, the core factor is trust. Trust, it's... It involves competence, objectivity, fairness, consistency, credibility. It's easy to lose, but it's hard to restore. And good experience creates credit, and bad experience, it will be lost forever. And we need those research participants in research and in surveys. And then a third point is uh, the, the translation to policy. Um, it's one of the ultimate goals of uh, biomonitoring that it should lead to preventive actions and increased awareness at a personal level, but certainly at uh, a policy level. And also we get here, this is from Belgium now, <coughs> typical expert reactions, oh, but this will cause panic, we are objective, they are subjective, uh, we will lose control, uh, there are practical constraints, etc. So it's a very complex issue, team here, there is a scientific complexity because it's a, a cocktail of great diversity of uh, all relevant elements and it's interdisciplinary. But also on the societal uh, side, it's, it's a societal uh, complexity. What is the social meaning of biomonitoring? What to monitor and what do we do with the results? Who decides, etc. So uh, a main opening characteristic are priority settings, and this is also some of the consequences of uh, COFIS, uh, which are the, the, the substances that we need to prioritize within Europe. Um, uh, we need uh, multi-criteria assessment, health risk policy, uh, expert assessment, and etc. So we have to share perspectives and critical mass as a basis for well-informed and substantial uh, decision making. Uh, we know the results of COFES or, or the, the recommendations of it, it, it may help because uh, it says, okay, we need more data. Uh, we need uh, a structure that uh, is really embedded within, uh, within Europe and which, uh, in which uh, transparent decision making is possible. We have to get better access to the data because it's all fragmented and no one, no one knows what they have and what is. It's, it's not comparable, and so we have to also have to link more to, for example, the European Health and Examination Survey. Uh, these data are there, and COFES and DemoCOFES were first step to to raise this awareness and to to begin thinking about it. Um, so. I will talk about the, the, the results and so later, but we thought uh, we should give these messages first. So we see that uh, there are still many challenges for protecting the human dignity and the rights of the individual research participants, while at the other hand, we want not to hamper uh, the progress of research. And practices show a strong belief in scientific work. There were a lot of perception studies also in Europe of women and uh, uh, study participants 
uh, involved in these projects and we see that societal acceptance of practices will depend on good communications at all level. And the future of research with human subjects will to a large extent depend upon the trust and the confidence which is built up in the perception of these research participants. So uh, thank you very much for listening to this small introduction. I hope we can uh, talk much further in uh, what we did what, for whatever you want to know uh, about these uh, COFIS demo, COFIS uh, projects uh, further on. Uh, I will tell that there's a good, um, a very good report, a layman report on demo COFIS is available also on, on, on the website. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks, that was very, so interesting. Uh, we're going to do a quick computer change because I want to give you a bit of a live demo of Herb Seussman's work creating the digital exposure report back interface. And while we're doing the computer switch, I'll give you a pitch for his workshop tomorrow afternoon uh, where you'll have a chance to uh, really work with the, the system and see what it can do. And uh, our colleague Laura Paravich will be here demonstrating her data experiences using the same data. We've been uh, reporting results with t-shirts and uh, large uh, remote controlled laundry hampers. And um, so tune in again tomorrow to, to see about that. Um, and I'll just be quick here today. Um, so we became interested in these issues about the ethics and social context of personal exposure measurements uh, through the household exposure study, which was originated by my colleague Ruth Ann Riddell, um, and was part of our breast cancer study. So we initially targeted about 89 endocrine disruptors. We have now more than 100 target compounds in our study, and we began with 120 homes on Cape Cod and expanded to uh, Richmond, California uh, with our colleague Rachel Morella frosch uh, and Phil Brown um, and to Bellinas with Charles. And um, the, we wanted, so once our, we started from breast cancer on Cape Cod and then we needed to know, well, is what's happening on Cape Cod different or the same as everywhere else? Because for 30 of our 89 count compounds, these were the first measurements that had ever been taken indoors. Uh, I, can't, I can't remember what I told you, I had air, dust, and urine measurements and a few blood samples. Um, so Richmond is, you can tell right away, quite different. Um, it's uh, next to a major oil refinery, uh, rail yard, and marine port. And Bellina is different again, up the coast in California. So um, very, within just a few days or weeks after we collected our samples on Cape Cod, um, our participants began calling uh, Cheryl Osimo, who's the founder of Silent Spring Institute and our coordinator on the Cape, and saying, Cheryl, when am I getting my results? And they grab her at the grocery store. Cheryl, what, that, was, that was great. They came to my house. When am I getting my results? And um, because of the, the context of our research, which I described before, these are our bosses, so we're not really going to say, um, no, we're not going to tell you. So we began um, thinking about what were the ethical and effective ways to tell people about their own exposures when the science was just emerging. We're studying these compounds because we don't know enough about them yet. Um, so that led to the, so you know, we're researchers, we've got a problem, we're going to study it. So we created the Personal Exposure Report Back Ethics Study, which now includes interviews with participants in eight studies that have reported personal uh, exposure results, uh, including, we've interviewed researchers and participants and IRB members and held a workshop for 44 stakeholders. Sorry, I lost the carriage return there. Uh, and done observations at community meetings and, and done some user testing of the reports that we've developed um, in our studies 
and um, then developed a new a new uh, digital method that we're testing now. This this work has been funded by NIEHS and the California Breast Cancer Research Program, for which we're really grateful. And since this is a uh, a conference about collaboration. I thought I would just this is the this is the cast of characters in order of appearance. Um, so Silent Spring Institute and Mass Breast Cancer Coalition originated the study, and then um, you see um, our colleagues joining us as we began to explore different dimensions. So this team includes the toxicology, because you need to know what the chemicals are and what the chemicals do and where they come from, exposure scientists, how do you measure them, um, uh, public health, human health scientists, sociologists, psychologists, uh, communicators, uh, and community partners including Charles and um, Communities for a Better Environment as well as Mass Breast Cancer Coalition. Um, and then we began to consider legal problems then we need a computer scientist. Um, then we wanted to test our new methods and, and teamed up with the Centers for Disease Control Greenhousing Study and the Child Health and Development Study. So um, this has been a really uh, very, um, very rich collaborative experience for us. Um, uh, Rachel, Rachel Morella Frosch is here, and Phil is here, and Charles is here, and Ruthann is here. So, and and Herb Sussman. Uh, so many of our team members are here, and I hope you'll grab them to talk about this some more. So, um, we we in our practice, we're studying many different kinds of studies, but in our practice, we believe that um, individual report back works well in the context of community report back. Um, so people get their own results and they get the study-wide results and there's uh, some kind of forum for discussion of those community results and often uh, interaction with the news media about them. We think that results should be reported in a multi-level way. Some people want to know the details, some people just want to know the headlines. Um, we found that people like both text and graphics. Some prefer text, some prefer graphics, graphs. Um, and we feel a responsibility to, ex to communicate what we know and what we don't know. And uh, in that same vein, we think there's a right to know and to not know. So that exposure reporting begins with the informed consent, not just to be biomonitored, but you get to decide whether you want your results or not. Uh, and we also um, practice incorporating exposure reduction information at the time people get their reports. So um, there was a, a question earlier about what people want to know. And in our experience, uh, we found that people have this kind of basic set of questions. What did you find? How much? Is that high? Is it safe? Where did it come from? And most importantly, what should I do? And um, if you look at this set of questions, the, there are only two. There are only two that the researchers are really comfortable with: what did you find, and how much. So um, we're all stretching to try to provide meaningful uh, information about those other questions. Um, I've, uh, and you've already heard a some about what we've learned about participants' experiences. Uh, participants almost all want their results. Um, researchers who are concerned about this can be very reassured that reporting results uh, increases trust in the research team. 